We are running. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Sustainable Design Masterclass. I'm Raleigh Latham, this is Neil Spackman. We're dedicated to bringing you guys some of the top regenerative agriculture system designers in the world. These are entrepreneurs, permaculturists, ecologists, entre um, I think I already said entrepreneurs, people who are, are dedicating their lives to repairing repairing ecology and building businesses and repairing the things they love. So I'm just super stoked to be bringing, uh, coming back to you guys. Apologies, it's kind of late over here. And so this week we have Colin, Soyce, Colin Sice joining us from New South Wales. And it's super exciting to bring him on. I'm going to let Neil introduce him. That's so right. why don't you take it away, Neil? Okay, welcome everybody. Good to have you here at Sustainable Design Masterclass. Um, I used to be under the impression that there was no sustainable way to grow annual grains. Um, looking at the history of agriculture and all the civilizations that have had um, their soils collapse and seen ecological devastation through the production of all sorts of annual grains, um, and the ad since the advent of agriculture, actually. Um, and I used to think the only way you could sustainably do grains was, was if those grains were perennial. And then I met Colin at Permaculture Voices 2 um, and was blown away by what he showed us because he was doing something that I had never even considered possible, um, which was pasture cropping. And so he's been he's been on my list of somebody that I wanted to get on to the webinar for quite a while because I think what he's uh, pioneered, him and his partners, is a crucial part of making agriculture sustainable and um, a crucial part in how we can continue to produce things we love to eat um, without having our soil erode, without having our soil carbon depleted, without having to depend on you know, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, fertilizers. Um, not to say that we don't sometimes use those, to say that we can, you know, reduce our inputs while increasing our outputs. Um, and so I'm really excited to have Colin with us today and see what he's doing and to give you folks the options to ask him questions um, that are relevant to your own situation. Um, and with that intro, Colin, I want you to take it away. It's all yours. Thank you, Neil. What you said about agriculture or growing crops is absolutely correct. Um, we can't continue to uh, grow crops in the way we have, and, and that includes ploughing soil. Ploughing soil has been very, very destructive. Um, but to start my presentation, on this first slide, I have uh, profitable regenerative agriculture. Now, the reason I have that there is we certainly need to be profitable, but if our farms aren't regenerative, if we can't regenerate our farms at the same time as growing growing food or fi and fibre or growing anything, we really are wasting our time. We can't do it forever. In, in fact, what we're doing today, if we can't do it for at least a thousand years, um, we need to change. And obviously what we're doing today around the world with the industrial agriculture is simply failing. So we need to find another way of doing it. What I'm going to talk about today is what I'm doing on my own farm. And that's just what I have done. There are other ways of, of, of doing this. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's quite a few now different ways of doing it. So I'm just, I'm going to talk about how uh, how I've changed and, and why. Just uh, on the farm here, there's 2,000 acres or 840 hectares. I'm uh, 300 kilometres northwest of Sydney, and on the farm is uh, myself and, and son uh, son Nick. The soils are, are not, certainly not not fertile soils. They're, they're uh, old granite soils, pH. Uh, Quite well. Originally, well, when I started running the place, um, it, the pH levels were quite acidic. Now they're 
they're, they're quite reasonable. 26 inch rainfall uh, and in the central tablelands of New South Wales and um, uh, on the map there, on, on the bottom left hand corner is pretty close to where we are. <coughs> Just a few different enterprises that um, that I have here. We have ha we've run merino sheep now for 120 or 30 years. Not me personally, but uh, and now we run we run 4,000 merino sheep on 2,000 acres here. Cattle trading uh, when seasons allow um, and and, and when, it, when it's profitable to do so. The crops we grow is uh, um, about 500 acres, primarily oats, but it does change depending on, on, on what uh, 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 profit there is in different grains. No irrigation on, on the place here. And part of our enterprise mix now is native grass seed. And that has happened because I've restored the grassland here. Um, in fact, the native grass seed is, is one of our major sales. We also sell merino rams uh, as, as, as well. So we've got quite a few different enterprises. And also we have, uh, I, I started a breeding working dogs, working stock dogs, um, working sheep dogs um, oh, 30 years ago. And um, now dogs are sold all, all over the world. Uh, Kelpie, Kelpie dogs are sold all over the world. So why do I farm differently? Well, often it's said I farm differently because I'm a lunatic. That's probably true, but I farm, farm differently uh, for many reasons, and I guess you'll, you will work this out as we go along. But to get to this stage, I need to just go back and do a little lesson in history, I guess. My great-grandparents were some of the original settlers here in the district, and my, my great-grandparents settled here in the 18, 1860s. Um, now, it's an interesting thing, and I, I, I should mention it. Uh, my, it, it, we talk about um, uh, uh, different ways of doing things, and my great-grandmother, who's a photo of her in that photo, she was very much a matriarch, and um, you might notice that my great-grandfather's only got one leg. I can assure you it's that's not a genetic defect, he actually lost it, he got, had it amputated because he, he, he uh, got thrown off a wagon and, and uh, had to have it amputated. But the story, the relevance here is my great-great-grandmother went out and did all the farm work. There was nine, nine kids in the family, um, she went out and did all the, all, all the farm work and um, he went into the house and looked after the kids. So the roles were, re were, were reversed. Why I'm telling this story is that I've grown up well, with my father telling me stories about his grandmother, as in that old lady there in the photo. What I'm saying here is that she had a great influence on the whole size family for generations afterward and, um, and really set up uh, and influenced my father and, and indirectly influenced me. In other words, we need more women in agriculture and we need more, more, more women uh, really uh, uh, getting this, this agricultural systems right. And the reason why is that women are nurturers. Uh, us males uh, tend, to want to, tend to want to kill things. So instead of keeping things alive, as women do, we want to kill things and with, either with bulldozers or herbicides or pesticides or things like that. So I think if we had more women involved in agriculture, we'd do a better job. Um, so just go back a bit to um, the 1860s. The original grasslands were very high quality and contained over, over 200 plant species. Uh, very diverse and very high quality. Um, within 60 years, um, in the 1920s, the grasslands had declined enormously to about 30 species and, and, and soil erosion was a serious problem. We, we, uh, and what happened was that everyone in Australia at that time, except for the, for the Native Aboriginal people, were, were basically Europeans and had no understanding of how to manage this country. And I guess that's happened around the world. Um, so grazed it inappropriately really is, is what happened. My great grandparents did. Now, industrial agriculture was adopted in the 1930s by, by my father. Um, he, he adopted it because wheat, growing wheat was, was very profitable. 
in that era. Um, and my father in the 1930s didn't require any pesticides or fertilizer to grow, grow good wheat crops. There was no pesticides available then anyway, but he, that soil was good enough. It was a grassland soil. It was good enough to, 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 grow, to grow crops without fertilizer or without any inputs at all. We should be able to do that again now. He did it in the 1930s. Uh, we just need to learn how to do it again. And, and we, well, we need to, to restore our soil ecosystem, really. Um, but with my father, with the way he was farming, with ploughing, he, within 20 years he did major damage or destroyed the grassland and, and, and created major soil erosion problems. And those two photos there really showed, fortunately my, my mother had taken a photo of, um, of that eagle. That's a, an Australian native uh, eagle with about six foot wingspan. Uh, and, uh, but she took a photo of that eagle hung on a fence. And the, you can see the erosion gully forming behind uh, just five years after my father started farming. So he, he did major damage very, very quickly, which was a great embarrassment to him. And, and, and he fixed many of the problems, filled erosion gullies, began f uh, innovative f f fertilizer programs and, and introduced um, so-called improved species, uh, uh, introduced species from around the world uh, to improve the pastures or, or, or restore the pastures. So from 1950 to 1978, everything was sold in annual introduced pasture. They were fertilised with, with, with phosphorus fertiliser and he was ploughing and cultivating to, 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 uh, to, to sow crops. Um, and there was high, high use of pesticides then. In other words, my father adopted the early part of the Green Revolution, that what was happening after the, after the Second World War. And it worked very well in that era in that it was productive and profitable in that era. <coughs> but major things went, went wrong. Um, uh, it, it certainly, he'd lost all his, all his grasslands and was infested in weeds and unproductive. And to prop that up with artificial fertilizers and pesticides um, or chemical fertilizers and pesticides was costing my father on today's figures, it would cost $80,000 annually. Um, to maintain that. It was very expensive to maintain it. The, uh, the problem with that is that that's exactly what many people are still doing today, um, 70 years later. <coughs> so it started to crash uh, on the farm here uh, in, the, in the 1970s. It just, it, and it, even though we didn't realise it at the time, or my father didn't realise it, <coughs> um, it was crashing ecologically and you'll hear me talk a lot about ecology through this talk, but part of the problems was cost, fertiliser was become, costs were coming, becoming too high. Um, he was all constantly resowing pastures, so that was becoming a, a, a major cost. Rainfall no longer infiltrated because soil, soil structure w was, was destroyed. We had uh, acidic soil, salinity problems, trees dying, and really we were going broke, or my father was going broke. Now, this is no different. What my father adopted, he really is, <clears throat> as I said before, uh, part of the Green Revolution. Um, and, and, and it was put out there as a, uh, we need to grow more food in, in, the, in the 1950s. We need to grow more food to feed growing populations around the world. But um, what's happened is that agriculture has been influenced by, by uh, huge use of, of uh, monoculture crops and, and high use of fertiliser and pesticides, and it has been an ecological disaster. It, it, no matter which way you look at it, and, and, and uh, I know it's still promoted as, as the way to go, it's been a bloody disaster. There's no other way you can put it. Um, and, and now we, we keep hearing about the next green revolution of genetically modified crops. What do you want a next green revolution for when the last one failed? Um, it, it just, uh, we need to get off that, that bandwagon totally. So in that situation, recommended solutions are often more fertilizer, herbicide and insecticide, but and rarely address the reasons why more are, are required. So agriculture is crashing all over the world because uh, of, uh, it, it doesn't function in an ecologically sound way. And, and the problems are reduced soil carbon levels, which means we need more irrigation, 
reduce soil fertility, which which means we need more artificial fertilizer, increasing insect attack, more insecticide, crop disease, more fungicide. Now, when you start looking at that, there's a bit of a pattern starts to develop, and and that is uh, we need we need uh, more fertilizer, more insecticide, more fungicide, which I love to call moron agriculture. It just doesn't work. The only people making money out of this are the people selling the product or, or producing the products that, that we're using. It has to change. So many of the things we do in agriculture make someone else wealthy, not farmers and graziers. And we need to ask why we use high rates of fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides and fungicides. So there is a desperate need to change agricultural techniques around the world. Um, because they're all, they are all failing. So, but how do we change and what do we change to? So how do we restore our, our farms? And certainly Alan Savory has done a wonderful job in, in, in getting people aware of, of uh, and, and, and um, changing the way grazing is done. Certainly um, that's definitely one of the first things we need to do is change the way we graze our animals. Um, we can grow crops without out killing uh, existing perennial pastures and we can grow multi-species crops that mimic grassland function. And But more than that, we can do all of the above. And in fact, as we put more uh, or different techniques, if we start layering them on, on properties, and, and I'm talking about uh, different things like the permaculture techniques, um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, the, the uh, yeomans, uh, are things that Darren Doherty talks about. If we can layer all of those on properties, we'll, we'll get there a lot faster and, 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 and far better. So how and why did I change? During the, the, the 1970s, the cost of farm production was becoming high and unprofitable. But in 1979, we had a major fire, a major bushfire, um, and, and um, uh, we lost pretty well. Well, we did lose everything. We lost all the all the buildings on on on, on the property. Uh, Three thousand sheep were killed. Uh, virtually all of our fencing, and and we went from going okay financially to broke. Really, no money at all uh, overnight. So that was a major problem. Uh, but this is what what created the change in me. I had no choice. So how did I survive? A thousand ewes survived, which were used to rebuild sheep numbers. Most of those had bird ears and, and, and really uh, <laughs> were fairly second-hand looking. Uh, but I grew wheat, and I certainly learned to have a sense of humour. Uh, that was the only way you could survive. But growing wheat seemed to be a good idea at the time because I didn't have enough enough uh, uh, stock numbers. So I grew wheat the same way as my father grew it. That's that's all all I knew. Um, ploughing and scarifying and, and cultivating soil, but what that did was created poor structured soil, soil erosion, acidic soil, and like my father's era, it failed. Um, so what do I do, do now? How do I fix those problems? I went and got some agronomic advice, and, um, and what they recommended was double the fertiliser rate, had your ear in crops, use fungicides, use insecticides and better weed control. This, this was in, done in, in 1990 and same advice they give now. Nothing's changed um, and that was the advice at the time. I didn't accept that advice. It didn't add up financially. The recommended amount of nitrogen fertiliser was toxic to wheat plants. So, uh, it, And if it's toxic to wheat plants, there's something wrong here. If we're putting on that much fertiliser that it will kill the, the wheat plant, uh, uh, especially if we put it with the seed, this, yeah, there was, I, I just couldn't, couldn't go that way. So how did I solve these problems? Well, the way to solve those problems is like most Australian males do, is go and have a beer. That's a bottle of Australian beer. beer. And um, that actually was, was uh, uh, how pasture cropping developed or, or it, how, how it, it was uh, invented, really. Um, Good friend of mine, a neighbour, Daryl Clough, uh, and myself had quite a lot of beers one night, and, and um, the idea came out of that night. Uh, uh, about midnight one night, after about ten or twelve of those, um, ideas started flowing, and the idea of, of, of 
zero tilling cro a crop into grasslands came out of that night and really you had to be drunk to think of something so stupid because um, as Neil said before uh, at the introduction we've always farmed by destroying everything well we farm farm by ploughing and, and, and killing all the plants so why would two idiotic Australian drunk farmers uh, think they could do something different and um, within it within about two or three weeks uh, we'd, I'd, I'd tried it and Daryl had tried it also and it worked the first year and um, I'm going to explain uh, just how we did that, that but I, I also I've, I've spent the last 25 years fine-tuning it and perfecting it and, and getting it to work better um, but that's how the, where the original idea came from. There was no great philosophy in it, just just um, uh, plenty of alcohol. So how did I change from that from the fire? Um, I, I was really struggling. I looked for low input agricultural methods, um, and my, the it had to be more than low input. It had to be no input because I couldn't afford any inputs after that fire. We had no money at all. So I started looking for how we can do this without any inputs, stop using pasture fertiliser and pesticides, focus on ground cover, um, in 1993 adopted uh, allergic plant grazing, well, Alan was calling it different, um, time control I think grazing then, <coughs> um, and developed pasture cropping, combined pasture cropping and, 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 gra and allergic grazing in 1995, but what I really did was focused on restoring Winona to grassland, to native grassland. I wanted to take it back to where it was when my great grandparents uh, first settled here. Now, just a little bit on grazing management and what we're doing on, on the place here. Um, we're running two mobs of, of sheep primarily uh, um, 2,500 adult sheep, they're, they're all ewes that we run, um, 1,500 uh, in another mob of under one year old. Cattle are included within the sheep with the sheep when we've got them. There's 75 paddocks, and we're looking at three to four month plant recovery period or, or time by the time they they rotate and get back to where they started. Now, those adult sheep are also used to prepare paddocks to pasture crop, which I will talk about uh, later as well. That's just a mob uh, of uh, of that that last mob of adult sheep with the lambs uh, with them. Uh, and um, that mob would have about 5,000 sheep in it. And, and um, they're right before, up until the lambs are weaned, they run, run as one mob. So I keep talking about grasslands, but then there's a reason for that. Grasslands are the best benchmark we have to model our farms on to function as ecosystems. Now, in saying that, we don't necessarily have to have native grasslands, but it needs to function like a grassland. Uh, and, and grasslands are about species diversity, and, and that's not just plants, but animals, insects, or microbes as well. Um, if we get our farms functioning, functioning like grasslands, we'll solve all of our soil health uh, and, and diseases, reduce costs, and be more profitable. But pasture cropping also under, uh, requires an understanding of, of, of winter and summer, of how winter and, and summer growing, or warm season, cool season plants function. Grassland function is a template on which agriculture sh should be modelled. Now, this is a graph, and, and this is uh, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, so northern, uh, northern Hemisphere people need to reverse this around. But this is really how C3 and C4, warm season and cool season plants function. Um, and um, in, in, in the winter, the cool season grass or plants grow, and in the summer, the, the warm season plants grow, and they interact. There's an overlap. Um, but in a functioning grassland, you should have uh, uh, grass or, or stock feed there all the time, unless unless you are uh, in, in say in North Dakota or Canada or somewhere in an extremely cold environment. Um, you know that uh, you, you're not going to get much growth in the winter. But in most temperate areas, that's certainly where where uh, um, or how grasslands will function or at least they used to function this way, that way. Oh, 
I can't get this slide to move on. That's good, that's a relief. Um, right, pasture cropping, what is it? Uh, pasture cropping is actually perennial cover cropping. We hear a lot about cover, uh, cover cropping now, and, and um, uh, which is a, a, a wonderful uh, 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 method of, of uh, growing crops and, and restoring uh, soils and, and, and that. But pasture cropping is actually perennial cover cropping. Now, annual cover cropping uh, you, you uses an annual, use an annual crop to, to create mulch, control weeds, and improve soil health. Pasture cropping uses perennial grass to, to create mulch, control weeds, and improve soil health. Pasture cropping can also be companion cropping as well. Um, so why would you grow crops using, using pasture cropping technique? More profit to start with. Um, we can restore grassland and improve pastures with it. We can produce stock feed, we can produce grain. And in that process, instead of degrading a, a the soil and degrading a grassland or pastures, we can actually improve soil, soil structure, improve, increase soil carbon, increase nutrient cycling, water holding, all of that. And over time, we, we can uh, reduce, uh, uh, ha have le use less fertilizer, in, less insecticide, fungicide, and herbicide. Um, so it will restore and does restore uh, our, our, our farm ecosystems. Now, if we look at traditional cropping methods, this is ploughing or herbicides. If we just ask a simple question uh, of, of what happens when we've got a ploughed paddock or a paddock that's been, been um, uh, had weed control with the herbicide before the crop is sown, um, but when it's being prepared for sowing. Ask the question how much stock feed is produced on, on, on that paddock, and none. Uh, there's no stock feed produced on that paddock at all. Uh, how much pasture is destroyed? All of it. How much soil structure is destroyed? Much of it. How many nutrients are lost? Uh, a lot of nutrients are lost. Carbon is lost. We're losing carbon all the time, and soil erosion um, is huge on those, uh, especially on ploughed, ploughed soil. So just from an economic point of view, by not producing stock feed on there, yet we, we need to change that. And very rarely do it, does anyone factor in gross margins on loss of income by not having stock grazing those paddocks. So pasture cropping can produce uh, crops for grain and, and or grazing. It will improve pastures by stimulating perennial grass species and species diversity. It will improve soil health and increase soil, soil uh, um, organic carbon and, and will increase nutri nut soil nutrients. And probably just as important or more important, it will improve the farm ecosystem. Um, and it improves the soil ecosystem, uh, the, sorry, the farm ecosystem because it is restoring the grassland. You're keeping perennial plants there, which are in turn uh, improving the, the soil ecosystem or restoring the soil ecosystem. So pasture cropping is a perennial cover cropping technique where annual crops are zero uh, are tilled into dormant perennial grass or grassland. But it is more than that. Grazing and cropping are combined where each uh, and managed in a way where each, each one benefits the other. Um, if we just go back to that previous slide, and that's opposed to what is, is recommended, especially here in Australia, but all around the world, the cropping, uh, the, the, the guys that are farming and growing crops uh, and, and that don't, don't have animals have, over the last 20 years, I guess, in, in Australia, have removed all their animals from, from, uh, from the farms, and that's been, been a, a disaster. Uh, we need animals in agriculture. We need animals for many reasons. We need animals because, from a, a profit point of view, but we need animals to, uh, as, well, as weed controllers, but we need animals to cycle, cycle and add nutrients um, and keep that farm ecosystem ticking over. Um, with pasture cropping, we're zero tilling. We're not ploughing. Uh, we're not ploughing it. In, when I say ploughing, in a traditional sense of turning soil upside down, um, that type of 
uh, disc, pl disc ploughing. Um, we never kill perennial species. We uh, should focus on perennial species and keep them alive. Weeds are managed by creating large quantities of thick litter by using good grazing management of livestock. And weeds can also be co can controlled with very careful use of selective herbicide. And um, uh, I'll, I'll add more to that later. Uh, but that's used more in the transition stage uh, of, of, uh, of, of moving out of conventional agriculture. Uh, into a more regenerative form. So why haven't crops been planted in, in, into uh, perennial grass before? Uh, well, <laughs> mostly I think the real reason of that is no one ever got drunk enough before, but <laughs> there, there are some reasons, uh, unvalid ones. It was known that annual plants will compete with each other. Like we know that wheat and annual grass, will, like say something like wheat and ryegrass, will compete with each other and and, um, and certainly uh, reduce the yield of, of the wheat. Now, okay, but it was also assumed that perennial plants would be incompatible with cereal crops and that was just an assumption that was made. It was also assumed that perennial plants would also would, would uh, contribute to crop disease. Now, the crop disease one is absolutely not correct and it and, and um, Perennial plants generally are compatible with cereal crops. But no one had really looked at how nature worked, how natural systems worked in grasslands, um, and how warm season and cool season plants are, are compatible. Here's my graph again, and this will help you understand uh, what, what, how, how pasture cropping works. What I'm doing here primarily is the grassland here is dominated by warm season grasses, um, and uh, not a lot of, uh, not as many cool season perennial grasses. So there's a niche, there's a niche in the in, in the in the winter period here to plant a cereal crop, and uh, and that's exactly what we've done. Is what uh, when those uh, summer species go dormant, uh, then you can zero till a a, a, a uh, cereal crop of oats, wheat, barley, and I'll get on to multi-species crops uh, later as well of what we can do in that niche. Now that can also be reversed around. Um, here, if, if your farm has mainly cool season perennial grass, a summer crop can be pasture cropped into it. If there, if there is a, a summer dormancy or a, a, and suitable rainfall, obviously we need enough rainfall to grow that summer crop. So I'm just going to take you through a series of slides here now, and um, uh, of pasture cropping a, a particular paddock through through a full 12 month season. Started with a, a grassland. This is a native grassland. It consists of 50 or 60 species of of native native uh, plants. This is in in my summer uh, here in Australia in February. Um, we harvest native grass seed off it, off, off these areas, uh, and, and um, with, that's a, a vacuum harvest, harvester that we developed here. Um, and um, so we're harvesting native grass seed off it. Uh, then we're grazing it, um, uh, and then grazing it to mulch it. Uh, here we're grazing with sheep, but we can graze it with cattle. It doesn't matter what the the uh, the animals are, and um, creating mulch or well, creating litter. And then sowing into uh, that that uh, the litter of the dormant, dormant perennial grass. Now, that's what we're sowing into. Ideally, it, it isn't always as thick as that, but generally we we try to sow into that much litter. Uh, and and um, if you've got that much litter, you don't need herbicide. You you won't get uh, many weeds that will affect the crop if you've got that much litter. Um, and, and this this crop didn't have any herbicide uh, as well. So the crop then is emerging. These, these uh, photos are all taken pretty well in the same same plot place, emerging through that litter. In fact, if I just go back, that litter really looks like a vegetable patch. In f in fact, we should farm close to how we garden. Uh, we put mulch and litter on on a vegetable on, on vegetables or a garden, and and and, and plant plant uh, uh, seeds into that. That's really all we're doing here. 
is creating the mulch, we're creating it with, with animals flying that, that material on, onto the soil surface. So the emerging crop coming through, the, all that lit up, um, and, and so on with, with zero tool planting equipment. The, um, uh, that's uh, uh, early spring, looks like a normal crop by now. Um, that had, 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 had been grazed as well with, with, with animals uh, before that time. Uh, coming up towards uh, 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 towards harvest or, or seed formation, and then harvesting the crop. Now, if we look at that photo, um, the green through that crop are actually the summer warm season grasses starting to emerge uh, uh, un in underneath that, that that crop. They don't affect the the, the crop um, because they lay dormant uh, up until that time. We're harvesting native grass seed off off the crop also, uh, as well as well after generally after the grain is harvested, we're then harvesting native grass seed again. So we're harvesting native grass seed usually twice on that one one area, one paddock in in a, in a season. Uh, now uh, we're looking uh, the seed is sold for revegetation work, and, but in the future we look at uh, we're certainly looking at, at avenues for for seed use for human consumption. And the reason why that is the Australian Aboriginal people, the native people here, have used native seed as a food source for 50,000 years. And that knowledge needs uh, rediscovering, and it's something that I'm working on at the moment. Uh, and, and so we actually do have a perennial crop here. Uh, we have perennial food source, a perennial crop with that native grass, grass and native grassland. Um, and we're sowing an annual crop into that grassland. So we're getting two crops plus grazing many things off, off that crop. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the area is also grazed again after harvest. So, okay, you'd think that that would be enough, but I had been searching for quite a while of, of, to, to do this better. Um, and uh, what I'd been doing, I'd, I was searching for uh, ways that I could improve my soil health and soil carbon and nutrient cycling even faster than I, I, I was doing it. Uh, and, and I started looking at adding other species to that, to the, primarily to oats. And I started experimenting with oats and field pea and, I was, and also millet and cow peas in the summer. And the results were promising. Um, but I didn't have all the answers until I met these guys. Um, and good friends with with uh, these these three guys um, now, which is you, some of you would know them. There's Gay Brown on the right, and Gail Fuller in, from Kansas in the centre, and David Brandt from Iowa. I met them in 2012 when I was speaking at Natural on the Plains conference in in, in Kansas, um, and also communicating with with uh, scientists, American scientists, uh, with Jill Claverton and Dwayne Beck. The answers, uh, and, and now we, we, we're sharing information all the time, uh, uh, th th these people at, and I, and um, and also uh, people like Gail Fuller is adopting uh, uh, pasture cropping. Gabe has been trying to head that way, uh, but very difficult for him because there's not an ecological niche at, at, at that far north in, in, in North Dakota. Uh, but what these guys were doing with it, with multi-species mixes, was the answer to me. Um, but I would, I was doing it differently. Uh, we, with annual cover cropping, um, that is the cover to prepare the soil. It's basically a biological primer for the main crop of either of, of, of corn or soybean or whatever is following them. My multi-species crop is is the crop. Um, my gra the grass, the perennial grass, is the cover. So it's reversed around. So how do we produce excellent, excellent forage for grass-fed animals while doing, doing all the above? Like what, what, what all the below. Uh, restore grass, grasslands and, and perennial pasture. Reduce fertilizer, reduce herbicides. Uh, eliminate insecticides, eliminate fungicides. Improve soil health and soil structure and improve nutrient cycling. Now, I'm going to show you some more slides, and some of these are the same as what I showed you before, but there is a difference. 
starting with the grassland again, harvesting the seed. This time, instead of sowing a single a, a, a monoculture crop in there, I, I'm, I'm now sowing uh, a multi-species crop in into that that litter of the dormant perennial uh, uh, grassland. Now, so these next photos are the result of that. Uh, in this mix that I've been using, oats for uh, 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 forage brassica, uh, annual vetch, daikon radish or tillage radish, clover, field peas, turnip. Um, there's a few others as well that I'm trying. Um, Favour beans this year, um, it, it just goes on. And that mix is whatever works for you really and fits into your environment. Just some more photos there um, of the mix of, the, of, of species with the dormant grass, uh, the dry uh, grass is the dormant summer grass and everything else is growing up through it. Just more photos of that, you can see vetch and oats and everything in there, it looks very untidy, the, the uh, uh, traditional cropping farming guys would have a heart attack if they saw that messy looking crop. Um, just more photos with clover and, and, and radish and many things in there. Now, that mix of four to ten species um, sown into a dormant grassland produces superior quality and quality stock feed. Far, far faster improvements in soil health, soil carbon and nutrient cycling. It, we can add nitrogen with legumes um, and scavenge other, other nutrients as well uh, with, with these mix of species. Uh, you, get, you can get weed control uh, with that with a mix uh, using the right balance of species. Insect control by, by adding flowering plants in there and, and we can still harvest a cereal crop after grazing. Now, there are advantages, great advantages in, in, in grazing from this, like far, far improved grazing, uh, in, in that we've got far healthier animals and that makes perfect sense if you think about it. It's a better balanced diet rather than just a single species. Uh, far healthier animals, faster fattening uh, on, on these crops, faster growth rates and, and we're producing more stock feed. Many, many benefits uh, with it. Now this is a multi-species crop that I had in, in 2015 and this is an Irish farmer who came to have a look at what I was doing and and, um, uh, and, and he was going to take uh, these, these techniques back to Ireland with him. Uh, this is a mix of oats, vetch, uh, uh, pea turnip clover brassica, brassica sown in, into, a in, into a grassland again, pasture cropped. Now what I want to do here, oh, I'll just go back, this was grazed as well but I only grazed it lightly, I want to see if I could harvest a mixed species of, of, of grain and this is what we did, um, harvested it and we still had everything in there and harvested a mixed, a, a mixed species and this is a photo of that of that uh, mixed grain, and I cleaned it or separated the small seeds from the large seed to try and work out what combination or, or percentage of everything I had. It did work very well, so we can harvest uh, uh, mixed species if, if we want. If we just go back, um, if uh, if if we graze this earlier, we can take out all those broadleaf ones with animals and, and leave the oats behind because. The animals will will selectively well they will graze graze everything, but oats and cereals will recover from that graze, whereas the broadleaf ones like brassica uh, and pea and, and those won't recover from 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 great from heavy grazing. Um, okay, and we're still harvesting native grass seed off these areas as well, and grazing them. Um, now there's a photo taken exactly in the same place the following June um, and, and so we've still got our grassland intact, most of that, like that's our winter, uh, uh, cool season grasses are greening through that, the, the dry is the, uh, is the remnants of the warm season, uh, warm season grasses, uh, just, just uh, um, that's only what six months later, six, seven months after the crop was harvested. So over a 12 month period, if you look at what's been, been achieved off, off, the, the, off these paddocks, we're grazing the grassland, grazing the crop, grain from the crop and 
vegetables. Now, I know in some parts of the world, if you graze an, a, 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 a paddock, you can't harvest food for human consumption of it, but we do have huge potential to grow vegetables in a grassland. We can grow vegetables for human consumption because some of those aren't what I'm growing, like turnip and pea, pea and, and, and radish are, are all vegetables. We can just increase that, that percentage of vegetables if we want. Now, I haven't worked out how we're going to harvest them yet, yet out of this grassland, other than we harvest for our own use. Uh, out of it, my, my son and his wife harvest, uh, 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 use vegetables, and I, and I do too, out, out of the um, out of the grassland here, but it could be easily uh, moved forward to a commercial thing as well. So we're grazing grassland after harvest, native, we're harvesting native grassland, and all of that is, is done, all that production is, is done by with, we're improving soil structure, soil health and nutrient cycling. Um, uh, we've got insect and crop disease control, reduced or no fertiliser, no insecticide, no fungicide, no ploughing, and we restored the grassland and soil ecosystem. Methods we're using, I better move on here, I'm, I'm going to run late. Um, now, pasture cropping can be very low input or high input. A lot of misconceptions about what it can and can't be. Providing you're maintaining or keeping the perennial, uh, perennial uh, pastures or grassland species in there, you can do many different things. If we use no fertiliser or herbicide, we, we will we often will have, not always, but a, a lower crop yield, we will have good perennial grass recruitment and good ecological function. But if our focus is on high production, we can produce crops yields, grain yields, equal to any of the, the uh, um, uh, uh, industrial agriculture uh, uh, grain, grain yields. Um, if we if we add more inputs into them, like we can use use uh, more fertilizer and do some weed control, um, we can get good crop yields. We do have less less perennial grass recruitment and less ecological function, but it is still miles better than what is happening now with industrial agriculture. So anywhere along that line is fine. In, in reality, many of the uh, pasture croppers around the world are somewhere in the middle of all that. Um, but there's more and more going for for uh, organic into organic production uh, with pasture cropping as well. Now, in regard to preparing uh, or, or pasture cropping, intensive graze is used prior to sowing the crop, um, and that's to prune the roots of the plants. In other words, we're not going to grow a good crop if if there's there's uh, competing plants in there. So we we want to uh, stress the perennial plants that are there and also do something about the annuals, uh, as annuals as well. We're doing that with animals. So uh, animals are placing litter on the soil surface. They're adding dung and urine from the animal, which, which will benefit the, the crop with nutrients. Open the canopy of the grass to prevent shading and conserve moisture. And removing a lot of the dry material prevents a lot of the temperature nitrogen depletion or nitrogen drawdown that happens, uh, that can happen if a lot of dry material is, is on, on the paddock. Um, that's just a, a photo of, of a crop that's been sown in, in the grassland. So the, the root pruning thing is something that, that really made, got this to work. Uh, uh, and um, uh, it, was, it was vital uh, in, in getting, this, getting it to work well. And, and by grazing it short uh, it was the key. And there's three plants there. Uh, if, if we graze, if we graze it quite short, we will reduce we'll, we'll reduce the root, roots of the plant, and also uh, reduce the top as well. It can be done with grazing or mowing, but grazing is better in that it's, there's, there's not a cost involved, and it's also uh, adding adding um, uh, nutrients for the crop. Um, pasture cropping without herbicides. Um, there's a few techniques we use, and, and we can combine these, or, or uh, but these, there's, a, there's a few different ways we can do this. So the crop dry before rain or before weeds germinate is one way of doing it. So the crop into dormant perennial grass, which is primarily what I'm doing here. Use a slasher or mulcher um, uh, pre-sowing if, if, we, if, if weeds are, are, are growing. Um, 
Um, and so a fast growing multi-species crop and so crops at higher plant density it is a few different ways of doing it without herbicides or to move to more towards uh, organic uh, pasture crop. Um, zero till seeders, <coughs> zero till seeders are, are um, what we should be using for, for pasture cropping. There's no nothing new in all of that uh, in in that. Uh, zero tilled seeders that are used for conventional uh, uh, cropping methods now, although many people here in Australia are converting their own and doing it their, their own very cheaply by converting old chisel ploughs or cold, uh, uh, scarifiers, or, um, so it can be done relatively uh, cost effectively uh, rather than spending $100,000 on a, on a seed drill. Just want to uh, uh, define ze uh, zero tillage. Uh, some people don't understand that. Defined as a system of, of planting sowing crops into untilled soil by opening a narrow slot or trench of sufficient width to obtain proper seed coverage. No other soil tillage, such as ploughing or cultivating, is done. Um, so that's primarily what we, we're uh, uh, with zero tilling is. However, um, many of you know of or know. Um, Darren Doherty and Darren, uh, uh, I, I saw a yeoman's plough or a deep rip plough will actually, uh, I, I found that, that um, it has a kill zone. Now, uh, uh, this machine is in Victoria or, or so, southern Australia and working very, very well. Just to show you some photos. Uh, as you can see from that, there is a kill zone of about eight inches wide which a crop can be planted into. So we're using this technique of, um, of key line farming and, and applying some pasture cropping principles to it. So it's a combination of, of, of key line and pasture cropping and, and, and multi-species crops um, are working very well there as, uh, uh, also. Herbicides. Um, if, uh, if we're trying to produce optimum grain yields, uh, herbicides can be used used uh, with, with pasture cropping, but the important thing is that the perennial grass species are not to be killed. So in other words, things like like, like uh, glyphosate really is, is out of the question totally because it, it will kill everything. So more selective use of herbicides um, and, and careful use of herbicides um, to control weeds that will affect crop yield and, uh, and and we can use some herbicides to enforce an early dormancy on the perennial grass. Um, they're the main things there. Um, I could, if there's questions on that, I'll go and answer that uh, in more detail. Uh, there's been a lot of work done here in Australia on pasture cropping and in other countries as well on research work. Um, when I first started, everyone thought I was a total lunatic um, and, and I got a lot of criticism, mostly from agronomy people. And so I encouraged research work here because I could see it was working. And, and um, so there has been quite a lot of research work done. Now there's over 3 million acres worldwide um, uh, that is pasture crop on varying rainfall and on all soil types in cropping areas and grazing areas. And in Australia, from lat latitudes 22 south to 42 south, um, so which is a fair fair range, uh, it's about 2,000 kilometres, uh, obviously in Australia, not in the middle of Australia, but where all those dots are is where the pasture cropping is happening in Australia. But many countries now, in, in, the, in the US, in, in South Africa, um, yeah, many, and, and, and I think in South America as well. Um, Research work being done by a leading research organisation uh, show that increased water use efficiency, increased nitrogen use efficiency, and increased total plant biomass. Sydney University research work and ecological study showed it in, in, uh, it, over time the increased perennial grass by 71%, almost double soil organic carbon levels, double nitrogen, double microbial numbers, and I'm running double the sheep numbers here. This was a, a, a fence line comparison with, with, with a neighbour. Um, and and that, that's the results from that. Um, now, this work, the work was done at the Land Institute in Kansas, uh, comparing pasture cropping to, to no-till no and hay production. And interestingly, the results were 
almost identical to the research results that were happening in Australia. When pasture cropping first starts and soil structure is, is not good, we can get uh, a decrease in yields of about 20%, uh, which showed up here. Uh, as soil improves out, the, the yields aren't, aren't any, much any different really at all. But uh, there was 20% less yield, um, pasture crop produced more hay, uh, pasture crop improved soil health and pasture crop increased perennial diversity and it was more profitable as you can see on, on along the bottom. Pasture cropping uh, was, uh, had a profit of $82 an acre, no tool was $50 an acre and hay was minus uh, $29 an acre. Um, so it showed up there as more profit at, in, in, at, the, at the Land Institute as it did here in Australia. Um, how does it, uh, 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 how does pasture cropping stimulate perennial grass? And it stimulates perennial grass recruitment from seed that's, lay, that's laying in the soil. What's happened here on my farm on Winona is that I haven't planted any perennial grass at all. Uh, the seed has sat there for decades at least, uh, more, maybe more. And it sat there uh, just sitting there dormant and waiting for the opportunity to grow. Um, and, and this really puzzled me, but it certainly puzzled scientists as well why this was happening because we, no one's been able to achieve this before other than good grazing management will do, do this to some degree, but this speeded the whole process up. Now, how does it do this? Small soil, a small soil disturbance while planting is, is something that's happening, but the big player in this is red exudates from the crop. Red exudates is really uh, um, improving the soil ecosystem right along the drill row where that crop is growing, where, especially oats, and, and, and improving um, uh, the, the uh, uh, soil microbiology and improving the soil ecosystem and creating an environment where those perennial seeds have, are, are, are happy to germinate in. That is the, really is the main reason. We're just creating a very healthy environment for them, for them to grow. After all, they've sat there for you know, 50 or 60 years in some cases and maybe even longer and didn't want to grow. So that is probably one of the best things that pasture cropping does. We can restore grasslands very, very rapidly now, providing there's some seed left in the soil. Uh, and this validated uh, re that, that work. It was a, just a small research work done um, showing that, that pasture cropping um, increased seedlings far greater than, well, certainly by, by doing nothing or uh, and grazing uh, and, and grazing as well. So agriculture and sound ecological practices should function together and that's what's lacking really in, in industrial agriculture. So what did I do on Winona? I changed grazing management to plant, plant grazing, changed the way I grew crops to pasture cropping and I didn't plant any native grass seed. Now these are just, these are results uh, like uh, uh, done by uh, mostly, mostly Sydney and Canberra University uh, on the place here. We've seen increase in, 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 in native grass species from 10% to over 80%, decrease in weeds from 60% to less than 5%, and increase in native grass species from 9 to, to 60 uh, in, in individual species. Um, no insecticides been used for over 20 years, and we have no insect attack in, par in, in parches. How is this possible? Um, what's happened is that insect numbers, and this has been measured by Lise Wendon, uh, uh, insect numbers have increased by 600% and insect diversity has increased by 125% and we no longer get, have insect attack in, in, in crops or pastures. What's actually happened is that we've got now, the, the, the increase in numbers has come from predators like, like, uh, like spiders and, and wasps which co control insects naturally. And in, actually the use of insecticides will ultimately lead to more insects and more insecticides. We cannot uh, control insects by using insecticides. We need to, to, to have natural control. Um, so no fungicides have been used for over 20 years um, and we don't get crop or pasture disease. How has that happened? Well, I saw microbe tests have shown a huge increase in fungi and bacteria and protozoa and, and beneficial ne nematodes. Um, and really having healthy soil with a large diversity of soil microbes will control 
plant disease. In other words, if we restore our soil ecosystem, most of our problems will go away. In fact, most of the, our, our um, problems associated with industrial agriculture are, 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 are created the symptoms of the way we grow crops. No fertiliser used on pastures for over 30 years and, and re we've reduced crop fertiliser by over 70%. How have we done this? Um, there's more ways of supplying fertiliser to plants, uh, uh, supplying nutrients to plants uh, than applying fertiliser. Mycorrhizal fungi supply uh, will basically all the nutrients, um, um, including trace elements and water. Um, Protozoa and nematodes uh, supply nitrogen and other nutrients, and free liver and nitrogen fishing bacteria supply nitrogen as well. There's plenty of ways of getting nutrients. Um, there's, there's plenty of nutrients in the soil. We just need, need to, to release those nutrients that are there. And this is the key to it. Living, growing plants are the drivers of soil health, soil structure and nutrient cycling. Plants add dead and decaying material to the soil, uh, which feed soil microbes. Plants exude sugars into the soil, which feed soil microbes. And that kickstarts the soil ecosystem. Now, some photos here uh, of adjoining fences uh, on my place and my neighbour's place. Um, and uh, my neighbour actually is my brother. Uh, and he, I, I've changed. My brother is, is farming the same way as I did. Now, my brother is a good, good operator. He's a good farmer. But these are just measurements of of, of the change that I I have uh, implemented on my farm. Um, these are uh, soil um, samples down to 500 millimetres or two feet. That uh, uh, from only about 15 metres apart, dug dug them out, and huge change in the soil. Uh, they're the same, exactly the same soil type. The one on the left now is forming soil down to 500 mil or, or, or over two feet. Um, and the one on the right is how I remember the soils on the farm here. Just about four inches of, of topsoil and then a sodic clay underneath. Um, it, it is quite amazing. Uh, I, was, I was very surprised that, that when Dr. Christine Jones and I dug those soil samples up. We've had huge increases in in, um, in carbon uh, now, and, and um, uh, it's increased by 200%. It, um, it, it sequestered over uh, almost 60 tonne of, of carbon, which is 300 over 300 tonne of carbon dioxide. Now it is sequestered per hectare. Uh, it holds over 200% more water. All of the soil nutrients, including trace elements, have increased by an average of 172%. Um, which is huge. Uh, so, uh, and pH has changed for, from uh, 5.2 to, to over 6. That's without any lime being added. Uh, there's been no lime added to either of the, these, these soils. Now, and we keep getting told that the industrial ag agriculture, uh, uh, by the industrial agriculture model, that we need to add, add more and more fertilizer. Well, no, we don't. Um, uh, this, the, this data is showing that, that uh, nutrients are all increasing, including trace elements, without the addition of fertiliser. Um, is it productive? Crop yields um, uh, uh, can be the same as, as, as industrial cropping, but when I first changed, as I mentioned before, crop yields were 20% lower until soil health improved. Now they're about the same as, as, as my neighbour's crops. Is it profitable? Yes, it is. I now save over eighty thousand dollars annually. That what we used to spend, or what my father used to spend on the on the, the, the green revolution stuff with fertilizer and pesticides, I don't spend at all. So I save eighty thousand dollars annually, <coughs> and um, those savings are are on pasture fertilizer, on cropping costs, um, and on, on on animal veterinary costs. Uh, we don't re-establish pastures. We, we have perennial pastures with over 60 species. Do not have insect attack or crop disease. Uh, the property now is regenerative and resilient, and it functions in an ecological sound, ecologically sound way. And and we are profitable. Just uh, looking at the the, the uh, production here, um, annual income now is higher. We are running more livestock now. 
than uh, we ever ran, ran with the in industrial uh, methods of farming that my father was using. Um, <coughs> um, crop yields are similar because we're growing uh, merino wool, which is very high quality wool. Uh, the wool quality is, is is better, and the wool here goes into very high quality fashion garments. Uh, and now we produce we produce about 20 tons of wool a year on the place now. Um, <coughs> Uh, we don't drought feed livestock, and we harvest and sell over over a ton uh, of native grass seed annually. Um, soil organic carbon levels are increasing. Soil phosphorus, calcium, pH, magnesium, uh, all the trace elements are all increasing, and that's with eighty thousand dollars less inputs, and that's not counting labour. If I counted labour, the figures would look huge. No one would believe it. Um, we're employing two less people now than, than we used to uh, previously. <coughs> so, how can we reduce more of our farms without destroying uh, uh, we without destroying our, our farms and, and the soil? Now, this is not um, uh, uh, new. Uh, um, uh, Joel Salatin has probably perfected. This and I know, uh, I know Gabe Brown is doing a lot of this, and his son Paul is doing a lot of this. Many people now are starting to do this. But if we, stay, if we, if we stack our farm enterprises uh, vertically, if we add it more, more, more enterprises and stack them vert uh, uh, vertically, we can produce more of our farms. And I'll just touch a little bit on this, not much. Um, so on the place here, we're producing different types of grain, sheep, meat, wool, cattle, vegetables, native grass seed. Um, and also sequestering carbon. Um, now, to achieve this, it's very important to have a diverse perennial grassland or pasture as the base of the enterprise. If we have a very a, a perennial base, we can stack anything on top of it. The number of enterprises is only limited by imagination, um, and this method can produce a diverse range of food, regenerate the landscape, and be very profitable. But the enterprises need to be ecologically compatible and they need to be financially compatible. But and if the farm enterprises are ecologically compatible, they will regenerate the farm and be more, more profitable. In other words, they will complement each other if they're ecologically compatible. And, and I think the limit is, uh, uh, there is, isn't a limit on the number of enterprises we can, we can stack, providing they complement each other and, e ecologically. A farm should function as ecosystems. You probably get sick of me saying that. that. Um, now, agriculture doesn't have to destroy a farm's ecosystem and the planet, which is what agriculture is doing now. Industrial agriculture is destroying our farms, ecosystems and the planet. Good agricultural practices, good regenerative agricultural practices can produce vast amounts of good quality food, can regenerate grasslands, Restore soil ecosystems, supply and so cycle soil nutrients, control insect damage and plant disease. But to do this, we can be profitable and regenerate our farms, but agricultural practices need to function closer to how nature had originally designed. Okay, thank you. Is that, are you done, Colin? Are you ready for questions? Yep, yep, finished now, done for, uh, ready for questions. All right. I thought, um, everyone, I thought everyone may have gone home, gone home. No, we've got 50 people on. <laughs> uh, we had some questions in the middle where I told them they had to wait a bit. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, I, ju I just want to comment a little bit. I don't know how many people attending are familiar with my work, but you and I say a lot of the same things. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, the only way to make agriculture sustainable is if we maintain ecological function. Whether that ecology you're trying to mimic yeah. is a grassland or a savanna or a forest, um, or even in yeah. aquaculture, that we need to maintain those healthy water and, and nutrient cycles, and the only way we do that is by mimicking uh, nature's e ecosystem. Um, yes. 
And it's really funny to me that it was a brush fire that was the catalyst for your transition into this. Um, because you're the second farmer I've spoken with recently who underwent major changes because his back was against the wall and he, could, he couldn't figure out anything else to do. Um, this is a farmer I know in, in Minnesota who um, lost everything in a fire and converted to grass-fed dairy production. Um, and he says it saved his farm. I don't know if he went out and got drunk before coming up with the idea. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the takeaway lesson, folks. If you're up against the wall and you've lost everything, go have a few beers with your friends and write down whatever you come up with. <laughs> um, I think, Colin, I think it's really fantastic what you're doing. I think it's got massive applications in a lot of other places. And um, it's uh, really glad I could have you on. Let's move on to the questions. Uh, the first is from Tanya Hawkins. She says, our pastoral plains were not in native grassland, but native bush and scrub when the first settlers arrived. All our perennial grasses are introduced. What is your experience in these areas? Can we create a biodiverse grassland? And is there a niche for pasture cropping? We have 900 millimeters of rain and medium to river silts. Yep. Okay. Um, it is interesting. Yes, there are some areas that, that um, uh, weren't grassland, but they were treed areas, but it is, um, and I often get that here in Australia, but if we go back far enough in this country, a lot of the area that we think is was uh, was, was had, had uh, timber or, sh or, sh or shrubs on it uh, actually weren't, it was, was grassland. But anyway, that that's beside the point at, at the moment. Now, uh, yes, we can pasture crop into into areas, uh, it, it, and we get areas. I'll use an example in Western Australia. Here, uh, it, it um, a, a lot of the people now are, are, are re-sowing or planting um, uh, introduced perennial species. Now, what's happening there is that if they they are selecting warm season grasses. Uh, warm season plants to sow into there and setting it up so that then they can pasture crop into those warm season grasses. So if, if you're starting with, to sow a pasture, you can actually plan it that way um, and, and, and create that niche artificially if, if, if that's what you want to do. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether that answers the question. It totally depends on on the type of species you have, like I'm assuming that where that question has come from uh, is mostly cool season grasses, so there could be a niche to put warm season crops, uh, annual crops in, into there, especially a multi-species warm season crop. Um, especially again, if there is a, a niche or, or in that summer period not much is growing, uh, and, and that, that certainly is a way of doing it. I think Tanya is in New Zealand. Is that right, Tanya? Oh, okay. She says we're at 45 degrees latitude in southern New Zealand. Okay. Yep. Yep. As you get that far, that latitude, and including uh, north, I know a uh, guy Brown in North Dakota um, uh, has, he's, does struggle. He's tried to get pasture cropping to fit there, and because his winters are so cold, there isn't really a niche for for it to work. Um, certainly not organically. Um, so there, there are limits, but, but not as many as most people would think. Um, in, as you get into those cooler climates, some t there isn't often a, a, a niche, even in, in New Zealand, there may not be um, a, a niche uh, at, 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 uh, at, at times. But that's where um, I believe the... Um, the work that Darren Doherty and, and I've been involved in, it, uh, in, in sort of, I guess, helping to plan the the the, um, the, the, the machinery um, with with a, a, a yeoman's type plough, creating a, a kill zone 
and then planting multi-species crops into that is a, is a very good way of doing it if you don't have a niche to, to grow, grow a crop into in, in, in the type of pasture growing that I've developed. All right, the, the next question, Colin, is from Wayne Bird, who I think is in California. He says, why sow plants that won't recover after grazing? Why sell plants? Not sell, why sow plants? Why sow yeah. plants that won't recover after grazing? Um, it, uh, I'm assuming he's talking about, um, uh, oh, I see, I, I think I know what, what, what he means. Yeah, yeah, okay, in a multi, um, I'm making some assumptions here. Um, I th think when I, I, I said that uh, um, I, in the multi-species mix, uh, you can actually remove some of those species from that mix, but with grazing animals. Um, now, I rushed through that a bit. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this is what he means. In a mix of, so, say, yeah. it, is that where the question is, in that multi-species mix? Yeah, I, I believe that's what he's getting at. Okay. Yep. If we sow a mix of just, and I'll keep it simple here, just to, uh, of say oats, forage, brassica, and 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 uh, field pea. Um, now they can be grazed. That the 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 forage brassica and the field pea uh, can be grazed. Uh, the, the field pea may may only tolerate one grazing and then it's gone, but the forage brassica will handle about two or three grazings. And, and then it won't recover from that. However, a cereal crop will recover from three or four grazing, providing it's not grazed past the, uh, which is called boot, the booting stage or when it's starting to form a head in, in, in the stem of the plant. Um, now, we can use animals to remove those, those species we don't want in there to then harvest grain. And that's, that's why I said that, the harvest grain from, uh, from the oats. Now, there's many, many reasons why you might you might uh, include a plant that that doesn't recover uh, from grazing. It's it's done a wonderful job. Say a pea won't generally it won't recover much from the grazing, but it's put down a, a, a big root system. It's 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 a legume. Uh, it, it's it's out of nitrogen, um, and we can look at this the other way. We can also pl sow plants that that aren't that palatable at, when they're green, and, and faba beans are one. I mean, including Fava beans, or fava, fava beans they're called as well. Now, animals don't like them very much, but what they'll do is, is produce a big bushy plant, do wonderful work, a wonderful job in the soil, um, uh, and, and generally not that palatable, but they will eat the beans and the dry material later. But, uh, mm -hmm. so, but that's good from a soil health point of view. So I, have I, I assume, yeah, that's the type of question, uh, yep. uh, or the type of... Yeah, where you're coming from. Uh, Tom Stewart says, genetic diversity seems to be a common theme. Do you manage your livestock for genetic diversity as well? And same question for the beautiful dogs do you breed. Do you manage them for genetic diversity? <laughs> um, yeah, certainly we, we're with, um, with livestock. Uh, yeah, we, we're looking at livestock's an interesting one when you're breeding lines lines of, of, of animals to for for uh, uh, like you want genetic diversity, but but in saying that you need need the, the to them to be productive in the manner that you want them to be. I'm producing basically wool growing at, at machines, wool growing animals. Um, so we want them to to produce very high quality wool and, and to grow a lot of wool. But we have enough uh, genetic diversity here, you know, with, with 4,000 sheep anyway. And, and we, we're always selecting uh, and purchasing different rams, different males to, to add to that, that genetic diversity within the type of animal we've got. Um, the genetic diversity in relation to uh, uh, bugs or insects, I assume that's what, it, what, what the question was. Um, oh yes, Mother Nature will look after that without any problems at all. We just need, need to create the, the environment for them and then everything else will, will yeah, build it and they will come, really, is the answer to that. All 
All right, the next one is from Hamish Bielski. He says, what is the legume content like in your grasslands for growing fast lambs on mum? I don't yep. know what he means yep. by on mum, but I assume you do. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Now I understand what he means. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it, for grow, yeah, okay. The, the legume content is, uh, is about 20% of, of that grassland. Uh, of that, uh, and that's, that's through that winter period. Um, but there's also other species in there as well. There are some introduced species in, in that winter period, like uh, rye grasses and, uh, and that as well. So, yes, um, while the lamb is, is still not weaned, still on the mother, um, they, do, they do very well. Uh, there's there's eno uh, uh, enough uh, protein in, in that pasture, in that, in that grassland mix to, to uh, 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 feed young animals. And I, I'm assuming that that's what what uh, uh, what he he meant. There's certainly. Hang on, I'll, I'll just backtrack a little. In the summer, there aren't any any uh, uh, um, uh, uh, legumes in there. Um, it's something that I could add, uh, but there's clover in the in in the in the mix, and there's lucerne or alfalfa in some of the areas as well. Cool. All right, this question is from David Haight. He says, how did you plant behind the yeoman's plow? Were you using the OEM shank pot or something else? And can you comment okay. on, uh, I can, well, let's do that one first and then we'll get to the next one. What okay. did you use to plant, to plant on that? Um, now, Darren and Jason Hagen have been the main ones to do the work with this. Um, and I, I've just added, at a, a bit along the way, uh, as in Darren Doherty. Um, now, tried a few things. The, the shank pots will sort of work okay, um, but but not as as good a result as as what we eventually came up with. The um, uh, tried doing it with a a, a small a, a tine. Uh, and, and that didn't really work very well. The, on that photo, um, I could go back to it, but it would probably take a bit of finding. On the photo I had there, what, what has been set up on that, that, that uh, machine of Jason Hagen's was uh, he put in a zero till double disc, uh, uh, double disc uh, um, unit uh, off a zero till machine. And it, it does a wonderful job. It does a little bit of cultivation in that kill zone, which, kill zone, which has already been loosened a bit by the, the main tine. And it, it's not putting, it's not sowing it right in the centre. It's off to the side because you don't want to be putting it in the in the centre. The seed may go too deep. So it's only just being just going along like a, a, a zero till disc unit and, and and dropping the seed half an inch deep in there, but not right in the centre. Just to the side, but still in the in the kill zone of, of, of where that big time has gone through. And remember, those those machines have have about uh, the the, the um, uh, row spacings or the gap gap between the tines uh, is two feet. So there's plenty of of of, of green grass and, and, and uh, pasture in between those rows. Okay, the, the follow-up question to that, Colin, is can, can you give a brief comparison on uh, the results from plowing with the key line plow versus a no-till driller? Did you find there was that uh -huh. much difference yep. between them? It totally depends on soil, soil condition. Um, if you... There's pros and cons for for um, deep ripping. Um, I haven't done I haven't done any deep ripping here at all. Um, I've I've actually uh, fixed the soil and soil structure with perennial plants and grassland plants. I, I've done it with plants. That's one way of doing it. Um, the uh, there's no doubt that you will get a better crop. A, a, a better a, a better yielding crop with a zero till uh, drill. The main 
reason I'm mentioning the um, the keyline uh, yeoman's type uh, uh, drill is that it is a good way of doing it for a, an organic producer that's in a an environment where there isn't a, a, an ecological niche uh, that, that's going to give you a, a niche where nothing else is growing that a crop will grow in. Um, uh, and it's a way of doing it without using a herbicide and without full ploughing. Uh, it, it, and it's mainly designed really to, for adding adding to your existing pasture and, and putting a, a forage species in there that, that, for that. Um, I need to be careful with, with um, those types of deep tillage implements that you don't overdo it, that you don't don't um, uh, uh, continue in the same paddock each, uh, each year, uh, then you'll start to do too much damage to your perennial plants. Um, it's just, uh, <laughs> there's no real way to answer that, totally depends on your soil type. If you've got soil like concrete, well, uh, a, a, a deep rip uh, tine or a yeoman's type plough do, do a very good job on it. So that's, there's no one answer. Great. Uh, Owen Hablitzel. Owen, I need to have you on this webinar, by the way. Uh, good to have you here. He, he mentions, he says, it was also a fire that motivated PA Eelmans to develop key line design. Uh, so there's a third example of, of fires on farms pushing farmers to innovate. Yep. Many, many people change because of of uh, 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 serious things that have happened to them. Um, I know Gabe Brown tells the story of, of that he was, uh, they, they were uh, struggling financially, which is why he, uh, a reason he changed. Um, I know other people here in Australia that have, have changed um, because of se se very severe droughts um, and, uh, and changed because of that. So often, unfortunately, people change because uh, often because of uh, um, serious things that have happened in their, in their lives, and ideally we we could ch we should change before it gets to that stage. Really, absolutely. Actually, that's it's somewhat similar to me. It was uh, I didn't have a farm or a fire, but it was a bit of a crisis that pushed me to do the project in Saudi Arabia that I'm doing, uh, yeah. which is agricultural, yeah. but very, very different from what most people think of as agriculture. Mm, uh, yep. We've got um, a question about your BRICS levels. Do you measure your BRICS levels and do you find they're increasing? <coughs> and do you have data yes. for organic matter percentage <coughs> increases in your land? Yep. Um, BRICS levels uh, are interesting. Um, it's a pity they weren't more repeatable. Uh, in that uh, it's difficult sometimes to evaluate the meaning of them, but yes, I have I have got a bricks meter and I and I use it um, uh, every now and again. And yes, the bricks levels are increasing. Uh, bricks sort of really measures, I guess, photosynthetic capacity of plants. So if things are functioning well, the bricks levels should be higher. That's me they're measuring sugars in in the plant. Um, so yes, the bricks levels are increasing. Um, and what was the second question there? The second, the second question was about your soil organic matter. If you've measured increases oh. in, because you brought up soil yes, carbon, yep. and he's asking right. about soil yep. organic matter. Yep, yep. Well, soil organic matter. It really, or cut, we should be talking uh, re ideally about soil carbon. Um, uh, soil organic matter is. Um, uh, the measurements are almost double the carbon level. So, but uh, anyway, yes, the organic matter levels are increasing. The carbon levels now have got to about three percent, which would be about or oh, somewhere around about five percent organic matter. That's in the top um, uh, top six inches. That, that, that's uh, the carbon levels or the organic matter levels are are increasing in in that top. Uh, Top level, but interestingly, in 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 relation to that, <coughs> the the carbon levels are increasing down to well now a meter. Well, we've measured to uh, to about 600 mils to get at least a couple of feet, and the, and the and the carbon levels are increasing. They've increased at a greater percentage 
um, at depth, they've increased by 300% at depth. Um, uh, so they're increasing at a greater depth, at a greater, greater percentage at depth than they are, are near the top. And that's because of the big root systems of the perennial plants. Um, so yes, uh, and, and to answer the question, organic matter levels and carbon levels are certainly increasing. Yeah. Um, Colin, do you see yourself moving toward more polyculture cropping as you go on? Do you think, well, how are you going to do this in the coming years? Do you think you'll move towards more poly or do you think you'll go back to the, uh, the more okay, grain? Yep. No, um, I, we're using a combination of both now. We're using uh, polycultures, about half of the crop we put in this year. Um, a couple of 200 acres we've put in as, as a polyculture, a multi-species mix. Um, we're using that multi-species mix at the moment for livestock feed and, and, and many of them we're taking through to grain as well. So, um, and some of the later crops that we're putting in, like we, we, we finished sowing oats last, like a, a, a monoculture of oats, again, always pasture cropped. Um, uh, later in the season, and there wasn't the advantage of of, of sowing a, a multi-species crop at that stage. Um, it was it, the weather was going to get too cold, and we wouldn't get the grazing result off it. Whereas we will certainly get grain results. So it depends to uh, on um, on what we're trying to achieve. But yes, we will move more and more towards polycultures because there's, there's many many advantages in them. Right. All right, the next question um, from Allison G. She says, can you please give advice on how to manage a property with heavy rat tail grass infestation? Um, this is a noxious weed and it has been recommended to us to use heavy chemical application. Yep. <clears throat> do, you, do you know what the botanical name of it is? Of, of, uh, it, if it's, I know there's a there's a species of Sporobolus here in Australia, which is commonly called rat tail. Uh, or are they talking about a, a, a fescue? Do you know what they're actually talking about? Let's, Alison. Do you know the the Latin name for the rat tail grass you're talking about? Let's make sure Alison. Yep, Alison's still here. Uh, let's see if she responds in the chat bar. Um, but while we're waiting, let's let's go on to the next one. Um, Karen says, "Thank you very much for a great presentation. Could you go over again your grazing methods for preparing the land for seeding, and when you go over the annual plants?" Uh, with, it's, it's, a, it's a question about the timing of when you go over the annual plants with respect to maturity and seeding. Okay, I think I've got that. <coughs> um, the grazing component of, of pasture cropping is very, very important. Um, and it was the key for me to getting it to work, uh, to work well. And, um, <clears throat> and, and part of the key, well, the, 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 it, we need large mobs of animals or a small area. We can tighten up the area if, if we don't have enough animals. And <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry about that. <clears throat> Too much talking. Um, now, uh, one thing that I, I, I found was if I sowed into high, tall, very tall grass. The result was disappointing in, in that the, the crop uh, or what I planted there was slow to, to emerge because many of these species don't like being in the shade of, of the crop of the grass. Also, <coughs> if it's still even even though it's going into dormancy, it's being affected by the root system underneath. So it's very very important to prune the top, which also prunes the, the root system, and then it drops a lot of the material, a lot of organic matter from the roots into the soil and we're laying a lot of that material onto the soil surface as mulch to plant into. So it's, it's a very, very, very important. However, um, we also need to, to not um, uh, uh, affect the health of the animals, as in take weight off the animals. 
we, we need, don't need to stress them. So what I do is about two months out from uh, a crop planting date, <clears throat> I start to graze it as t really intensively. Um, and then instead of uh, giving, giving that area three or four months recovery, I'll bring them back again in a month's time. Um, so that, and that, that, that's about a month out. Now, every time they're going on there, they're, they're also transferring a, a lot of dung and urine, a lot of nutrients onto that area. So, and then about two weeks later, I'll bring them back again. So, so they've had three grazings, um, and, and, and it's being tightened up each time. You could put them on another time if you want to. <coughs> so, what it's done is <coughs> reduce the plant, uh, the plant mass down. Um, it's, it's put litter on soil surfaces, put dung and urine on, on, onto the soil surface. And it's stressed those, those plants, whether they're annual or, peren or perennial, ideally perennial, they've, you've stressed them to a point where you're wanting to favour the crop that you're going to plant. So the animals are doing that. Instead of using a herbicide, if we can graze them very hard with animals over a period of time, we will stress those plants so they're not going to affect the, the to-be-planted crop. That, that, that we're going to put plant into those grasses. So we graze them down as short as we can, but we do it over a period of time so we don't stress the animals and we don't take weight off the animals. And they'll also do a better job in that they're bringing nutrients on each time. But the shorter you can get that grass, uh, the better. Um, and, and, it's, uh, and it's related to the numbers of animals per, per acre or per hectare um, and the time that they're on there. Um, I hope that answered that question. Um, it was another one about annual plants, which I sort of didn't fully understand. <coughs> no, I think you got it. Uh, this okay. next question is, is uh, we've only got a few more, Colin, if you can hang in there. Um, oh, no, I'm fine. That's fine. All right, cool. Um, do you know of any folks practicing pasture cropping who have tried to integrate alley cropping? as well as another stacked enterprise and do you see that there would be any advantages or disadvantages to having a row of trees in here that's producing another crop for you? Yep, most definitely. <clears throat> um, great way to go. I know in, in Western Australia uh, um, they're using, uh, they've, they've got uh, Tagasasti which is a tree loosen uh, mm -hmm. in alleys and um, uh, and, and pasture cropping between them, and and some people, um, there's, there's a, a friend of mine called Bruce Maynard that developed a very similar method of, of cropping as pasture cropping, that uh, uh, he's sowing <coughs> alley farming in in saltbush, which is a native um, native uh, shrub in Australia here that uh, is very high quality grazing value. So yes, there are people doing it, and um, it's certainly a very very good way to go. Um, the crops need, sorry, the trees. The trees need to uh, not um, uh, re remove too much moisture and water out from out from the, the uh, out from the, where the trees are for it to work well. The crop will benefit um, the the trees. I don't think that'll be a problem at all. Uh, um, so yes, definitely a good way to go. That's just just on a personal note. That's kind of my dream farm, where I've got alley cropping yeah. integrated with pasture cropping, and running multiple enterprises off of one land base. I think I think that's kind of the holy grail for me. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. We can, and that's another way of enterprise stacking, um, and, and a very good way of doing it. Then everything is complementary. I I I would definitely go that that way. And the trees can be whatever works, whatever there's a, yeah. they could be fruit trees, they could be, yeah, whatever, they don't have to be, the, one, the two that I mentioned were both grazing, grazing shrubs, but, um, uh, but uh, they could be anything you, you, that, that, uh, that fits into the enterprise mix. Yeah, but what we're doing in Saudi Arabia is uh, Moringa and Zizifus and uh, Prosopis, Mesquite and Jujube and Moringa stuff. Um, we don't have the carrying yeah. capacity to have animals on our land all the time. Um, so yeah. I've done a few run-throughs the years that it has rained. Um, 
we had 600 sheep on our side for a month this year after, well, no, that was last year now. That was in March of 2016. But that's, that's yep. kind of what we're aiming for where we are. But for us, because we can't get grasses on a regular basis and because we can't graze on a regular basis, the trees are actually going to be our bread and butter and where we make the yep. majority of our money. But the animal, we need the animals so that we can actually have plants biodegrade and complete the, the mineral cycle. Yes. Yep. Um, so while they are, they, I mean, they're not an input and I, I rent the land out to a guy who runs 600 sheep through them for a month and he pays me for that. But really he's giving me an ecological service while my trees establish. Um, but I do, I do think this model can have so many variations um, in a lot of different climates, depending on, you know, what your parameters are with respect to your climate, your geography, your politics, and your cash on hand. How much rainfall do you have in Saudi Arabia that they, where, where you're working? We and average we're, 60 we're millimeters a year. Six, 60? Six, zero, yeah, yeah. 60. Wow. Yeah. And we, we, yeah, went, some, uh, yeah. we went 37 months with no precipitation yeah. between January of 2011 and February of 2014. We had no rain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, getting, getting grasses established when you're not having rain for three years is not really a possibility. But yeah. there are trees yeah. that will survive that. And then when the grasses come up, we graze them. Um, so that we can get yeah. that, that mineral cycle connected. Yep. Yeah. In those types of environments, uh, in, uh, they, the grasses tend to be opportunistic annuals uh, that, that yeah. tend to grow on those rainfall yeah, it's events. It's all annuals um, and bushes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and the perennials are the perennial component are, are the, the the bushes or the grazing or the shrubs. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that, and that's really what you have to work with. Um, but it would be interesting. Will be interesting over time um, uh, of the way you're grazing it and managing it. Uh, I would think you'll start to get improvement in 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 those areas that you're grazing as well. Like you'll you'll start to get more grasses and and that as well. But within yeah, that I, environment, of course. I think we will. It's it's a question of can we get rainfall three years in a row. Because um, for us, it's the water that's the limiting factor. We have seen, yep. we've definitely seen um, an increase in biodiversity. We have seen, I mean, our soil carbon and our soil biology was literally zero <laughs> when yeah. we yep. started, yeah. right? So it yep. has increased because now there is soil biology. Um, so from <laughs> zero to something is worthwhile. I'm not sure how measurable it is. Um, but we've got uh, well, we got a couple more questions that just came in. Um, a bunch of people said thank you, Colin. Robert Hayes, Hayes says thanks so much for your time with us. Susan Cousineau said thanks so much for for an excellent webinar. Um, a couple people left early and said that it was very useful. Um, Okay, we got three more. Karen Lindquist says, what stage are the annual plants when you graze them? And do you graze the plants lightly just to get that regrowth from the annual grasses? Yep, okay, again, I'm assuming this is the, the crop we've sown. The, um, yeah, they, they need to be, in, in, in grazing a crop, or the, 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 so the multi-species crop or, or even just oats, it needs to be well established, and generally, it's not grazed, say, the oats or all of it, it until it's a, about a foot high. And to test it, if you get the, uh, uh, say, the plant itself or an oat plant and twist it and pull it, almost like a cow would, and it doesn't pull out of the ground uh, from the roots, it can be grazed. Now, in grazing it, um, uh, ideally, uh, it, it it, the better way to graze it is certainly um, like mob graze it uh, 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 with hot wires and move the animals on. Uh, the more more efficient way of grazing it rather than just let them wander all over the area. But uh, it shouldn't be grazed down. It, I mean, you're planning on getting three or, or four, say at least three lots of grazings off it in a season. 
and, and that totally depends on, on your climate, of course. But um, so you, we need to leave some leaf material on that on on those annual plants, so that because of photosynthesis, uh, you know, the the leaves are the solar panels. They need you need leaves on to to regrow quickly. So don't graze it into the ground. Uh, leave some leaf there and let it recover. Um, uh, and often about a month, about about thirty days. In, a, in a, an annual crop, you, 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 you would be able to graze it again, assuming it rains, of course. Um, uh, and and uh, just backtrack a little, from planting date to time of graze, and again, this depends on, on, on climate and, and rainfall, but from planting date to, to grazing can be about six weeks, if, if, say with something like oats and on that mix that I've, I've used. Now, a summer crop, a summer forage crop would be faster than that. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, let's see. Patrick Lynch asks, what climate, rainfall and seasons does pasture cropping work in other parts of the world? Do you need both warm and cool season rainfall to pasture crop, and do you think it could work in a Mediterranean climate with warm, dry summers and cool, wet winters? That's like four questions. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, it can work in or, almost anywhere, um, providing there's enough rainfall uh, to to grow to grow the crop. Um, where I am here, the, the the summer, the rainfall is reasonably evenly distributed throughout the year, um, and I have a, a, a dominance of warm season grasses. So the cool season crop uh, or annual plants with drilling in fit really well in, in that situation. Um, I have done a few workshops in California. Um, I did one last year, uh, yeah, last year. July in California, um, and it is an interesting environment. But I've done a lot of work in Western Australia here, uh, which is very, very similar to California. Now, what they're doing in in uh, in Western Australia, I think, would definitely work in California. And I did we did have some discussions on it when I was there. What has happened in Western Australia? And I think I mentioned this before. They've been sowing warm season um, perennial uh, grasses, uh, which will grow through a very very dry summer. So uh, and then and then grow into the into the, the the autumn or the fall and get production there, and then go dormant in, in the winter, and then you can put a crop into it. So what and and. I don't know anyone in California that's done it. I know in, in the Mediterranean areas in Australia, it's, it's being done more and more, um, and and it, and it should work. There'd be they, these warm season uh, perennial grasses are very tough, and I in in, in selecting the grasses, I would uh, preferably use um, a, a, a a native uh, a warm season native plant that ideally suit to that area and there's plenty of magnificent warm season grasses, uh, native grasses in, in the US, uh, beautiful grasslands that they were originally. So anyway, in saying that, yes, uh, there were, were warm season grasses in California um, and uh, if you want more information on that, um, there is some information out there and I'm trying to think of the, uh, a guy called Applebaum has, is a botanist, American botanist, has written written quite a bit on 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 that and what species were in California and, and all around America. Um, so and there were, were warm season grasses there. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, there there are some people experimenting at the moment in California with with uh, trying to get work out where where it can fit. So I hope that answered that question, sort of. Yeah, that's great. Um, Colin, we're coming up on two hours here. Um, you've got an, another round of thanks. Kevin Schilthe, Sh I'm going to say your name wrong there, Kevin. Kevin Schilthuis, or Schilthuis says, uh, thank you so much. Your work has transformed the way we farm. 
here in Wyoming. Um, Tanya Hawkins says, I've been following your work for years, Colin. You are an inspiration, and this has been awesome. Mary Combs says, this is directly relevant to the planning I'm doing right now. Um, and uh, I'd just like to thank you for coming on. We are going to wrap it up here, folks. Um, I do think that you've come up with something that uh, is a game changer for a lot of people. And I hope that in our small way we can help uh, disseminate these ideas and these techniques and uh, get more farmers preserving their soils, building their soils, and making more money. That's what, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, our next, our next um, webinar uh, for all of you folks listening will be on June 22nd, and it's with Tony Renato. If you don't know who Tony Renato is, he's, he's one of my heroes. He worked in Niger for 20 years in the Sahel region of Africa and came up with a series of techniques that helped um, subsistence farmers um, reforest their land and make a lot more money. Um, and as a result of his work, he, he's also an Aussie fellow. As a result of his work, um, over two and a half million families have been lifted out of poverty. Um, and something like 10 to 15 million hectares of land that was facing desertification has now been restored into forest. Uh, that's being farmed by small scale subsistence farmers um, in Africa. Tony Renato is on June 22nd. Don't miss it folks, because he is, uh, he's got some amazing experience and he's a really approachable, really friendly fellow. Um, and uh, that's going to be it for today. I'm going to cut the recording, and we 